Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for being here today at this talk about how to be a great astrologer. This is a topic that's really meaningful to me, and I'm super happy to have you all here. And I'm also super happy to be co-facilitated by none other than Ms. Lindsay Summers. Lindsay is uh, one of the senior students over at Oraculos, and I'm, I'm really honored to be questioned <laughs> by Lindsay. Uh, because yeah, yeah, we, we have a good uh, list of things to go through today. And I really hope that you enjoy our conversation. All right, I'm looking forward to questioning you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Right. Are you ready, Michael? I am super ready. Lori just typed in the chat that Lindsay knows everything. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well. I have questions. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff, Lindsay. All right. So, as we all know, there are many different entry points into astrology, and there's a lot of complicated information, contradictory information out there. So, is it important to choose a particular system of astrology to learn, and how do you choose? Lindsay, that's a really great question to start off with. And this question of systems in astrology is something that's also really near and dear to my heart because I believe that there's a difference between a system of astrology and the style of astrology. So by systems, we have particular schools and those schools can look like the Uranian school of astrology, which is a complete system within itself, or traditional astrology, which is a complete system within itself, or Vedic astrology, which is a complete system within itself. And all of those systems have branches and offshoots and probably different styles of presenting those systems, but essentially they all represent an internal cohesive body of knowledge that runs as the central unifying theme beneath all of its various branches. So within modern astrology, for example, we have things like humanistic astrology and psychological astrology and evolutionary astrology, and that the list goes on. But underneath modern astrology runs a central unifying theme that connects all of the different offshoots from the central system that we call modern astrology itself. So I do believe that it's important for a person to find a system to align themselves with, because when you align yourself with the system, you begin to grow systematic intelligence. And that systematic intelligence is important because it allows us to have something to centralize our efforts around. And that's something that we're going to go and talk about more when I give my top 10 things every astrologer needs to know about being a great astrologer. But fundamentally, we need to know how to organize our relationship to information and having a system that we can plug ourselves into helps us in that organization. So at Oraculos, for example, we practice what I call neoclassical astrology. And the neo portion of that is because we do use the modern planets. So we do use Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. I also use Chiron because I've tested Chiron now within the context of my work. And I'm even doing a research project on Chiron and the home. And so we use what are called the quote unquote modern planets, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, as well as Chiron. You know, Chiron is like the Y. You have A E I O U, sometimes Y. So we use Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, sometimes Chiron. But we don't go beyond that in terms of our classical presentation of the 12 houses chart. That is where we stick. So we're not using Maki Maki and Hayamea and Eris and all of these things, but we stick within that very tight knit framework. And within that framework, we pour rigorous classical technique. And so that's why I call it neoclassical, because it would be unethical to say that it's purely traditional astrology. We also use things like the declination table with an understanding of where that comes from and why that's a necessary part of our practice. We also use things like eighth harmonic aspects, so the semi-square, as well as the sesqui quadrate, with an understanding of where that comes from and why that is a necessary part of our practice and how we can trace the evidence of the semi-square and even a half of the semi-square, the 22 and a half aspect within traditional astrology as well. So 
I really believe in having that traditional basis. And if we integrate things in and on top of that traditional basis, we also have a discussion about why we're bringing that in and not just throwing things in our astrology because that is the nature of the 21st century astrology. So in answering your question, yes, a system is important because a system becomes that centralizing crucible within which we can bring in the other things that we want to practice without getting confused or lost by that multiplicity. And so after you choose that system, you need to learn it. So what, <laughs> what is the benefit of finding the right teacher? How do you look, teacher or mentor, and how do you find them? And that also is a really cool question, Lindsay. And this concept of mentorship is something that's older than the hills. We have always, within the context of received spiritual or mystical traditions, had an even greater tradition of passing information on hand to hand. And so this, this component of mentorship becomes a very important thing insofar as we're practicing a traditional system of mystical dissemination of information because that has always been the way. And it's not one of these things where we say, oh, that's how it's always been, therefore we, we keep it. But there's something very important and very integral about learning from someone and about allowing yourself to be humble enough to be in that space to actually learn and receive from the accumulated efforts of somebody else's practice. So for me, whenever I've wanted to excel in a specific area of my own practice, and this could be astrologically speaking, or some other aspect of my spiritual practice, or even some other aspect of my professional business practice. I've always found mentors that have been able to spot the defects and the flaws within my current approach to doing things, and then give me strategic, insightful input about how to transform those flaws into points of excellence. And mentorship becomes important for that singular reason, the fact that mentorship allows a person to be seen. And there's something very different when you see someone or interact with someone who has a practice that has been observed and that has been supervised versus someone who has a practice that hasn't had that level of external care pumped into what it is they're doing. And the observed astrologer, the supervised astrologer, the astrologer whose words and whose efforts flow out of them in a way where you can identify the fact that their words are also connected to a lineage or their words also come from some greater system of knowledge that they're operating from, that astrologer oftentimes speaks in a way and oftentimes practices in a way that's truly extraordinary. And I know that in the 21st century, that's a difficult thing for a lot of us to access, especially now that a lot of things are on Zoom and we end up having to interact with each other in this virtual way. But I think that the mentorship model is really important, particularly because we need to be seen. We, we, we need to be seen and being seen could be being peer reviewed or being seen could be being seen from someone who has had decades of practice before you. But there's something that solidifies within us when we are seen that allows us to know that our practice is reliant on a confidence that just hasn't grown out of our own efforts, but that comes from somebody else looking at us and saying, good job, like that thing that you're doing there, that's something to hold on to versus that thing that you're doing there, that's something you can let go of. And I think that only comes from being in that space of that student-teacher relationship or of that mentor-mentee relationship where you actually have the ability to be seen by someone else. And are there any other resources that people can look to when they're trying to learn astrology? You know, some of the resources that have been most helpful to me have been books, but books very specifically curated and books by people who've been dead for hundreds of years. And so for me, I found some of the greatest um, astrological resources come from these older books. And I don't necessarily mean ancient books, but I mean books that 
that still carry the essence of the turn of the century. Those, those books, books um, written in the late 1800s, early 1900s, or even the 16th century or the 17th century, those books really carry the seeds of what ultimately becomes modern astrology. And I think they teach us how to really begin to interact with the humanity of our clients in an even deeper way. So yeah, I love the ancient astrology books because they set up a framework for the philosophy of astrology that we're ultimately going to end up practicing. And in that regard, I think that it's important for us to read books that are thousands of years old, the Tetra Bibulos, the Astronomicon by Manilius, or the works of Firmicus Maternus, or Abu Mashar, or al Kabisi. all of these more traditional textbooks really set up a philosophical scaffolding for our astrology. And that, to a large degree, is something that's missing from 21st century astrology. 21st century astrology has a philosophy that was built within the minds of 21st century astrologers. And even if we say 20th century astrology, 20th century astrology was really this attempt to create and to find a philosophy of astrology because they did not have access to more of these older, more ancient root works of astrology. And when I look at the philosophy of modern astrology and when I look at the philosophy of ancient astrology, that ancient astrological philosophy is tied in with the larger philosophical framework that was being born at that same time. So classical astrology is tied into pre-Socratic philosophy. It is tied into the theory of searching for everything. It is tied into these larger existential questions because our astrology was being formed at the same time that classical philosophy was being formed. So in that sense, I think that it's really important for us to have an understanding of the classical philosophy that underpins the astrology that we practice, not because we're meant to recreate ancient Egyptian or ancient Hellenistic astrology, because I think that there's something very erroneous in that as well, this desire to recreate the astrology that was practiced in ancient Greece. You know, we aren't there anymore. We're in the 21st century. Our lives and our lived experiences are that much different today. But I do think that it's important for us to at least know how our ancient astrological forebears thought so that we don't get caught up within this thing of ego gratification, where we feel as if we are the ones filling the philosophical hole of, within astrology by adding our own philosophy to it. Because as far as that's concerned, the philosophical framework of astrology has already been set, and it's been set thousands of years ago. And it's important for us to understand that so that we can practice in the 21st century, no matter what system of astrology we're practicing, whether it's evolutionary, whether it's quantum, whether it's whatever system of astrology we're practicing, all of the astrology of the 21st century can benefit from us having an understanding of not just what our ancestors practiced, but what our ancestors thought. Because the ancient astrological paradigm was one that fundamentally asked the question, why? And today in the 21st century, 21st century astrologers struggle when asked these questions, why? Why are there 12 signs of the zodiac? Why are there 12 and not 13? Why are there 12 and not 11? Why do we view the cardinal axis as being such an important thing? Why are the 12 signs of the zodiac divided into the triplicities of four signs each or the quadruplicities of three signs each? Why should the word triplicity refer to something that has four signs and the word quadruplicity refer to something that has three signs? What is declination? Why is this term out of bounds important? Today, we have a very difficult time answering questions as to why. Why does Mars like to be in Aries and not Libra? Why and where did this concept of essential dignity come from? Why and where does this concept of accidental fortitude come from? Why is something stronger in the 12th house versus in the 10th house? And why would something else be stronger in the 10th house than in the 12th house? What is it within the nature of the planets that cause them to be stronger in houses that would make other planets weak? And what is it within the nature of the planets that causes them to be weaker in other houses that make other planets strong? These questions that underpin our astrology are fundamentally the questions that allow us to have a sense of rootedness within our practice. 
And insofar as those questions are questions that we struggle with, we need to fill those holes because the more of those fundamental existential astrological questions we answer within ourselves, the more confidence and the more faith we have in the astrology that comes out of us because we ourselves are founded on something older and something more concrete than our own present day ruminations. Well, you started to answer my next question, but I think there's a little more to it. So, you know, someone's found, they've, they've picked their system of astrology. They found their mentor, Michael Bryan. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be me. But yeah. Or, or someone else. Uh, but when, when learning astrology, you need to start somewhere and you start at the foundations. So can you tell us a little bit about the importance of learning those foundations of astrology and, and what they are? The importance of learning the foundations of astrology is that you can't go anywhere if your foundations aren't solid. And I'm reminded of this quote by Margaret C. Hone, who was an early 20th century uh, English astrologer. And she says that it does not really matter which of several necessities is learned first. But what matters is that we understand what those necessities are. And this is something that once again is really lost within the 21st century because we have this culture of pop astrology. And within the culture of pop astrology, we see the signs of the zodiac. We see the sun and where the sun is placed. And that becomes our entire understanding of our astrology. Our astrology becomes based on the fact that my Venus is in Scorpio and my Mercury is in Libra, or my sun is in Cancer and my moon is in Gemini. And we get so caught up within this sign-based astrology that we become blinded to the fact that there is an astrology that even precedes or that even comes before that. So the foundations of all astrology really takes us back to not even just the elements, but the pre-elements. And not even just the pre-elements, but the pre-concepts that formulate the elements. And so within our Western astrological and alchemical traditions, we have a concept of sulfur, mercury, salt. Sulfur, mercury, salt is really the basis of our entire astrology. But even pre-sulfur mercury salt, we have this concept of the duad, of the fundamental dichotomy that exists within the universe. But even pre that fundamental dichotomy that exists within the universe, we have this monad, which is this pre-cosmic primordial soup, or this pre-cosmic primordial field of potential. And that is really where our understanding of astrology should begin how the monad becomes the duad, how the duad becomes the triad, how the triad becomes broken out into the four qualities of nature of hot, cold, wet, and dry, how those four qualities of nature become broken out into the four elements, how the four elements become further distilled into the four temperamental qualities that also exist within nature, how they become distilled within the seven classical planets of ancient astrology, how those seven classical planets become the rulers of the signs to the zodiac, how their rulership becomes split within the signs of the zodiac. And then we could probably start to have a conversation about your moon being in Gemini and your sun being in Ophiuchus. And then we could begin to have those deeper understandings of, of that sign-based astrology. But if we start from there with the negation of this rich and tantalizing and vibrant pre- zodiacal astrology, we really miss out on a grand opportunity to become extraordinary in terms of our understanding of not just our micro person-to-person -person astrology, but this much larger macro universal astrology that holds within itself a theory of how this entire universe was created or how this entire universe was birthed into being. And when you know your origins, you know, in the 21st century, there's this whole call for us to return to our roots and to know about our ancestry and to know where we came from. But even astrologically speaking, when we know where we came from and when we know what those roots are founded on, it completely transforms the person who practices. And, and that is something that can't be bought. And that's something that also can't be sold. 
that comes through this deep dedication to wanting to, to discover who we are and wanting to trace the golden thread of our origin back to the stellar shells of heaven. And the foundations of classical astrology allows us to do that like nothing else can. And I'm not talking about the foundations of classical astrology as a course, I'm talking about the foundations of classical astrology as a system of understanding by itself. Right, and many people can get you know, overwhelmed trying to memorize like the meaning and interpretation of every possible planet, sign, combination. Like, What does this planet and this sign mean? What do these two planets and aspect mean? And so understanding those elements and pre-elements is the foundation of your approach. So how, how do you approach that when, when people are trying to memorize too many different things, having this understanding of those elements? How do you teach it? You know, when someone explains to you the reason why something is the way it is, it fills in a thousand blanks within your own self-knowledge. And that is the beginning of my approach. Within classical astrology, there has always been an approach to listing the reasons. And one of my favorite traditional astrologers, Abraham Ibn Ezra, wrote a book called The Book of Reasons. And The Book of Reasons is really a book that says, why are there 12 signs? Why are there 12 houses? Why do the signs go in the opposite direction to the houses? Why should anything go counterclockwise at all within an organized universe? It goes on and on, and it's laying out from him a philosophical understanding of why. So that by the time as you get to the end of the book, any other doubt that you may have about things to potentially memorize is completely mitigated because when you understand the why of something, it makes the practical use of that thing make even more sense. I'll give you an example. Squares within astrology are considered to be malefic and oppositions within classical astrology are also considered to be malefic. But why is that? Is it just because the angular relationship of 180 degrees and 90 degrees respectively seems to be oppositional and seems to be contrary or hard? Or what is the deeper philosophical reason behind why we view squares and oppositions to be the way they are? Well, within traditional astrology, we have a concept that oppositions are of the nature of Saturn and squares are of the nature of Mars. Because if you place the signs of the zodiac in the shape of what's called the Thema Mundi, which is the chart of the world or the world's chart, essentially, what you end up with is the oppositional relationship that Saturn has to the luminaries, as well as the square relationship that the Mars rule signs, Aries and Scorpio, have to the luminaries as well. So we find Scorpio squaring Leo and we find Aries squaring Cancer because from a traditional perspective, the world was born into being by having Cancer on the Ascendant or the world was born into being by having the two signs of the luminaries being the first two signs within the first two sections of this natal chart or this Thema Mundi of the world. And so when we set that up, we have that primary oppositional relationship that Saturn has to the luminaries, and therefore we call oppositions to be aspects of perfect hatred. And this perfect hatred or this perfect animosity piece is something that comes through our traditional language. And what we find is a lot of hard and a lot of colorful and a lot of descriptive language that traditional astrology uses. So when we hear something called an aspect of perfect hatred or an aspect of perfect animosity, it really sharpens for us the polarization that we find within an opposition. And while today within the modern astrological approach that we have, 
we tend to view things with far more nuance than that. It's important to understand that that was the ancient primary understanding of that opposition, so that when we interact with that opposition, we can realize that we're dealing with a moment of intensified polarization between the two things that those planets represent that are having that oppositional relationship. The square aspect, conversely, is called an aspect of imperfect hatred or an aspect of imperfect animosity. And that imperfection comes from the fact that a square is half of an opposition. So here we also find ourselves being able to wait, W-E-I-G-H-T, we find ourselves being to wait the relative heaviness or the relative importance of different sorts of aspect relationships based on the planets that traditionally rule or the planets that traditionally give their nature over to that aspect. Similarly, trines are of the nature of Jupiter, sextiles are the nature of Venus. And so this concept of greater benefic, greater malefic, greater or lesser benefic, lesser malefic, this translates not just beyond the fact that we know that Jupiter and Venus are the, are the greater and lesser benefic and Mars and Saturn are the lesser and the greater malefic, it translates also into the things that those things leave their imprint on. So for us, we should know that trines have the imprint of Jupiter left on them, and that imprint comes from the theme of Mundi. Therefore, trines are like Jupiter. Oppositions have the imprint of Saturn left on them because of the relationship that Saturn has to both luminaries on the theme of Mundi. Therefore, oppositions are of the nature of Saturn. And that follows through as a singular theme, because then the things that we know about Saturn also comes up in our analysis of an opposition, because ideally, oppositions should feel like a Saturnian relationship between two things that we have to, at some point in our lives, bring together to work harmoniously. But if we keep that Saturnian undercurrent there, it says to us that every opposition stands as a place of a great cosmic lesson for us to learn how to integrate two things that are standing at loggerheads with each other, whereas every trine comes as a blessing and it comes as an act of benediction because trines are also following the nature of that planet that first imprinted itself on them, in this case, Jupiter. So I went down a rather extensive rabbit hole with that, but the point that I'm trying to make, Lindsay, is that when we fill these primary holds within our understanding, by the time we get to the place of interpretation, the interpretational components of the astrology that we practice becomes that much easier and that much more salient because the first house is no longer just the first house. The first house is the first house, but it also has something to do with the nature of Mercury because Mercury has his terrestrial joy there. And so some of the things that we find imbibed within Mercury, the mind and the intellect and the self and all of those things also gets imbibed within that first house because the first house carries that imprint because everything within traditional astrology has the imprint of something greater. All right. And once in your course, once we've learned all of those foundations and those foundational elements, you have another unique methodology, which is that you start by teaching horary. So can you tell us a little bit about horary and why it is that you start with it? Horary astrology is a wonderful starting place for the burgeoning astrologer because horary astrology, first of all, allows us to practice astrology guilt free. I don't think a lot of people really take into consideration the fundamental guilt that's associated with the practice of astrology. And that guilt has to do with the fact that when we start from natal astrology, there's that much more pressure because what if we say something that's incorrect? Or what if we say something that gives this person false hope? Or what if we say something that makes this person feel unduly damned for the rest of their lives? So a lot of people have come to me and said, I practiced astrology for 20 years, for 30 years. People have even come and said, I practiced astrology for 50 years, but I still don't know how to give a reading, or I still don't know how to look at a chart. And a lot of that has to do with one, the 
internal vastness of the subject of astrology by itself. But the other thing has to do with there's a fear. There's a fundamental fear in terms of looking at a chart and making a judgment based on what you see, because there is a great level of karmic burden that we take on when we look at someone's chart and say something or make any judgment or make any prognostication, any prediction based on what we see. There's a karmic burden there and possibly there's even a karmic debt there. And so a lot of astrologers prevent themselves from entering professional practice because of this guilty conscience. And the guilty conscience manifests as, oh my God, I'm not good enough. Or, oh my God, I don't know enough. Or, oh my God, what if I fuck it up? Or there's all of these layers and levels in which the guilty conscience comes up. And horary astrology allows an astrologer to practice guilt-free. It's like a guilt-free diet. You can eat as many cupcakes as you like because they have no carbs or calories or whatever, which I would personally love because I love cupcakes. And so in that regard, it, it's a very guilt-free system because it teaches you how to get sharp within a very low-risk environment. And the low-risk environment is how do I get sharp at my astrological skills answering a question? This question isn't something that has an impact on this person's entire life. This person wants to know, should I buy this house? Well, maybe that's a little bit high up, so let's bring it down. This person wants to know, should I buy this laptop? This person wants to know, should I go on this vacation? This person wants to know, what will be the outcome of this job interview? Which are pretty low-risk questions, because these are questions rooted within the moment versus the, will I ever find financial success? Which is a natal question, not a horary question. Versus the, will I ever get married? Which is a natal question, not a horary question. So horary questions allow us to deal with the fundamental questions that make up the day-to-day -day brunt of our existence. They are the minor arcana of our existence, whereas the natal questions, the will I ever questions, are the major arcana of our overall life. And when you get sharp at horary, you get sharp at all astrology. And I think that's also an important thing for people to know. Many astrologers, including astrologers who are sitting here right now <laughs> listening to this conversation, have said, you know, I never thought that I'd do horary astrology because I just thought it was a yes or a no system of astrology. But it takes a lot of work to get to that yes or no. And the level of work that it takes to get to that yes or no is comparable to the level of work necessary that you then need to transfer into a natal practice. And what I have found is that astrologers who enter the field of astrology through the particular lens of horary astrology have a sharpness and have a clarity and have a penetrating awareness when it comes to their chart delineation that no other branch of astrology gives. Natal astrology oftentimes starts from the perspective of people wanting to know about their personalities, which is a lovely thing, because it's a lovely endeavor to want to know about my personality and the me and the my and the my, 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 because in the modern century where we find ourselves now, we're very egotistical and we love the sound of our own names and we love hearing someone sit down for 90 minutes and stroke our egos and talk about us and your first house is you, and your second house is you, and your third house is you, and look at your fourth house, it's more you. And even your seventh house, the house of other people, is you. And we, we love this because we're very egotistical in the West, and we're also very egotistical within this modern era of astrology. But horary astrology allows us to realize that the other things that make up the shape of our lives are also just as important as an understanding of our personality. The fact that you really want to know whether or not you should buy this laptop because this laptop seems like it's going to be the next thing that takes you one step forward in your career is a really important piece of information. And within the moment when you want to buy that laptop, that becomes the fullness of your being. Should I buy this laptop? And when you ask that question from the fullness of your being, the sky produces an answer that is reflective of the truth within that question, but also reflective of the answer of that question. And when astrologers can find both a question in a chart and also the answer to questions from a chart, that allows them to become even greater natal astrologers. 
Because after you've spoken about someone's personality for 30 minutes, the next question is, will I be rich? What can you tell me about my home life? Will I find a home that I find to be stable? Will I have kids? What's the state of my health or ill health going to be? What's the state of my marriage going to be? What's the state of my career going to be? These are the natal questions that people ask. And so beyond answering that first question that everybody needs answered in a nasal consultation, which is, who are you? The other questions come in and horary astrology teaches us how to answer questions from people's birth charts in ways that natal astrology and starting natal astrology first never can. All right. So you spoke about this sharpness and clarity that you get from horary astrology or learning at first. And can you tell us what you mean by that sharpness and clarity? And when you also talk about concrete astrology, what is that? And why is it so important? Concrete astrology is what traditional astrology offers. And it's not the only approach to astrology, but it is a vital approach to astrology. And I think that every astrologer should know how to practice concretely. So concrete astrology is using the birth chart of a person to identify the concrete events that occur within that person's life that all contributes to making that person who they are. And I saw in the chat that Terry was saying that after you hit 70 years old, this question about your personality kind of fades to the wayside. And then these other questions, these other more life-oriented questions rise up. And that is true, Terry. And what concrete astrology gives us is the perspective to do more than just a personality assessment. Concrete astrology allows the astrologer to move beyond the who am I question into the concrete circumstances that contribute to that person's life being what it is. Because who you are isn't just your personality being born in a vacuum. Who you are is this full and fleshed out version of you that has to do with how has your environment informed who you are and what does that home environment say about you today? How has your relationship with your siblings informed who you are? And what does that relationship say about who you are today? How has your relationship to who you know yourself to be inform how you interact with money? And these are the questions that concrete astrology allows the astrologer to answer. And these questions I find and these answers gives a person a more fuller understanding of the life that they've had. Because with, that fuller because with that fuller understanding also comes a deepened sense of peace and clarity and purposefulness within all the things that you've experienced within this lifetime. And then from there, I think the concrete astrologer should integrate some more psychological approaches into their astrology so that they can know how to speak about the personality and the psyche in a more nuanced sort of way. But I, I don't think that psychological astrology should be our starting point in astrology because our ending point is oftentimes predicated upon how we start. And I think if we start high, then the place that we stand to go to from there is either a higher place of even greater excelling within our astrology, or we stay at that high level and create consistently good astrology from there. Whereas I think if we start talking to people, or if we start our astrological approach from an assessment of people's personalities, it becomes very difficult for us to break free of that personality prison. Because if you spend 10 years, 20 years, even five years, only looking at astrology from the perspective of personality, that's all you end up seeing. And so if we start concretely, the concrete approach teaches us that there are far more things within heaven and earth Horatio than exists within our philosophy. And there are far more things within our chart than exists beyond our personality. So if we start from that concrete level and then dive into the personality from there, the personality-based astrology gets enriched because we would have already started from such a place of clarity, which is the concrete approach. All right, now I'm gonna hop over to a different question. <laughs> So uh, do you have a daily practice or a habit or something that you do to cultivate, help cultivate your astrological practice? Sadhana is a word that comes from, from yoga. And sadhana 
represents your spiritual practice and the sadhaka represents the practitioner. And a part of my daily sadhana is my daily study of astrology. There, there are three things that come to us from, from yogic philosophy, and they are called tapas, svadhyaya, and ishvara pranidhana. And tapas is having the internal heat or the internal fire to get up and do your practice every single day, whatever you determine that practice to be. So my daily practice every single day is to read a chart every single day, whether I have a client, whether I don't have a client, I get up and I read a chart every single day. And I also get up and I read a chart like a rookie. Like I get up and I go from scratch and I scribble out on my paper all of the things that I think. I scribble out my entire rubric and I read the chart like a rookie from the ground up every single day because that's a part of how I produce a sense of the extraordinary within my personal practice, but also within my astrological consultative field. So daily chart reading is integral for me as a major thing. Also, knowing what the sky looks like each day is a very important thing within my practice that I know how the sky is. And that doesn't mean that I check it consistently throughout the day to see, oh, what happened when I used the toilet or what happened when I brushed my teeth or what happened when I thought that thought. Those aren't the reasons why I'm looking at it. It's just a means of giving myself a thing to contemplate on and a thing to meditate on as a daily part of my existence in a cosmic ecosystem. So I do that as well. But the non-astrological things that I do that I think directly benefit my astrology practice is that I have a daily meditation practice. I have a daily Reiki practice. I have a daily one hour long Reiki practice in which I give Reiki to myself because that allows me to step into the world with greater peace and greater clarity. But that also serves as an incubation moment for the things that I've studied the day before to really settle into my consciousness in an even greater and a more comfortable way. So that becomes a part of my daily practice. And I also have a daily yoga practice. So I think that astrologically speaking, we should have the astrology specific things that make us extraordinary at our craft. And that could look like reading a chart every day, going all out, giving, allowing yourself to hear yourself, give a one hour reading every day. And that could look like looking at the sky, the moment that you wake up looking at the sky every single day. That could look like looking at the ephemeris every single day. That can look like doing many things, reading a chapter out of your favorite astrology book every single day. But beyond that, I think that there are greater self-care practices that we also need to implement because too much astrology makes a person go crazy. And this is something that a lot of people don't talk about. You go crazy when you look at the sky all day long. And the reason why you go crazy is because you have a human experience and you're meant to live within this physical, material, human experience. And you're not meant to look at the sky all day long. So we're meant to have this relationship between heaven and earth because we have feet that ground us into the ground but we also have eyes that allow us to look upward but those eyes are also meant to look downward and they're also meant to look laterally and they're also meant to look straight ahead and we're not meant to be constantly fixated about one thing there's a story about there's a story about uh thales who is considered to be the father of Western philosophy and one of the early Milesian uh, philosophers, you know, you have Thales and Anaximander and Anaximenes. And the story is that Thales was looking up at the sky because all of these guys were astrologers as well. That's the piece that they leave out, that <laughs> all of these guys were astrologers. The story is that Thales was looking at the sky and he was looking at the stellar configuration at that moment so intently that he tipped over and he fell into a well. And he fell into a well and this servant girl walked past and she laughed at him and she was like, ha, 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 you man of knowledge. You're always looking at the sky so much to the point where you have no sense of where you are on this earth. You're always looking at the sky to the point where you miss out on the point of life. So Thales, 
as a philosopher was not someone without an ego. So to prove a point to this little servant girl, he waited, he looked at that sky again and he waited on an astrologically auspicious moment. And he bought all of the oil presses within that particular region where he lived. He bought all of the oil presses, all of the oil of oil presses at a moment when there was no olive oil in sight. There were the, the, the crops weren't growing or they weren't producing anything. So there was no olive oil in sight. And he bought all of the olive oil presses because the sky that he saw indicated for him that there will be a bountiful harvest later that year. And when the bountiful harvest came late that year, all of the local farmers had to come to Thales to rent his olive oil presses, and he made a fortune. And the point of that story, whether it's true or not, is to say that our astrology shouldn't separate us so far from Earth that we don't know how to function and thrive within this Earth plane as well. And we as human beings, who are also astrologers, need to be able to balance both realities both the heaven and our earthly experience. So don't go crazy is the point. Find physical things to do to ground you every single day. Eat a piece of bread after you give a reading, make love to your spouse, do jumping jacks, you know, go for a swim, put your feet in the soil, but do things to ground you every single day. Because traditionally speaking, an astrologer wasn't only an astrologer. An astrologer was an astrologer and a master mathematician. An astrologer was an astrologer and a master flautist. An astrologer was an astrologer and a gardener, an astrologer and a doctor, an astrologer and something else. So this myopic view of only being an astrologer is also a very modern reality and we we should all have another thing that we do that 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 lessens the burden of even wanting to be so great in one thing that that thing becomes the entirety of who we are be an astrologer and a soup chef be an astrologer and a painter but be an astrologer and be something else that allows you to experience yet another part of yourself because we're meant to have a relationship to multiplicity, even as we go down one particular path of excellence. And what qualities do you look for in a great astrologer? So here we come to the list <laughs> because the list that I put together is essentially a list of the things that I think that every person should aspire towards as they seek to be a great astrologer. And when I say be, being a great astrologer, people sometimes hear that and they get on edge. And when I speak about terms like excellence, people hear that and they get on edge and they're like, oh, you know, how are you using this word excellence? Or why do you use this word mastery? And truthfully for me, I get very confused about that because why are you doing something every day of your life if you're not also setting an intention to be extraordinary at it? Are you waking up every single day and going to your job because you want to just be average or basic on your job? Or are you waking up every single day and going on to your job and knowing that and going on to whatever your job is, you are growing in a greater sense of excellence and authority and skill and mastery that at some point in time, you can pass on to someone else. So I, I, I really, I'm, I'm, people make me nervous when excellence isn't a part of their larger understanding of why they're doing something. We all brush our teeth excellently. We didn't start that way. But through years and years and years of practice and years and years and years of personal training, we've come to a place where we can brush our teeth with a sense of effortless effort. And that is also the place that we should be aiming towards insofar as our astrology is concerned. Excellence has more to do with transforming our effortful effort into effortless effort. And when we find ourselves practicing in an effortless way, then we can say that we've attained a particular level of excellence or mastery within our field. And those words shouldn't frighten us. And those words shouldn't intimidate us. Because everything that we now do with a sense of effortlessness and ease is something that we do excellently. We drive 
for the most part with a sense of effortfulness effortfulness we drive for the most part with a sense of effortlessness and ease you're not thinking every step of the way my hand must be here my foot must do this because if we did that there'd probably be far more car accidents in the world so we drive in a way that feels effortless for us and it isn't saying that we're the greatest drivers within the world but within the scope of our own ability we are all excellent drivers within the scope of our own ability we are all excellent tooth brushers or teeth brushers and our astrology should be no different. So some of the things that I think we can all do in terms of becoming excellent astrologers is first thing is to set clear and definitive goals. And by setting clear and definitive goals, you have to ask yourself, what type of astrologer do I wanna be? How do I wanna show up in the world astrologically speaking? And there's the macro question of that as, do I want to be a Vedic astrologer? Do I want to be a Western astrologer? Do I want to be a Chinese astrologer? Do I want to be an ancient Mesopotamian astrologer? Which, you know, school of astrology do I want to ally myself to? But then within all of those schools, there are the branches. Do I want to be a horary astrologer? Do I want to be an electional astrologer? Do I want to be a natal astrologer? And then within natal astrology, do I want to focus on synastry? Do I want to focus on medical? Do I want to focus on prediction? Do I want to focus on vocational? And then below that still, do I want to be a mundane astrologer? And within mundane astrology, what sort of astrology do I want to focus on? Do I want to focus on astro seismology? Do I want to focus on astrology and web? Do I want to focus on astro meteorology? What sort of mundane astrologer do I want to be? And so that's the first question that we have to ask ourselves. What type of astrologer do you want to be? And assuming that 80% of people who answer this question are going to say they want to be a person who practices some form of person to person astrologer, then the next question has to be, what do I want to do within that practice? And how do I want to show up within that practice? Do I want to practice in a more psychological sense? Do I want to practice within a more medical sense? Do I want to practice within a more natal predictive sense? Do I want to practice within a more concrete sense, a more esoteric sense, a more karmic sense? What type of astrologer do you want to be? And this question is something that I had always felt within myself because I never make decisions within life unless I know what sort of practitioner of this thing do I want to be? And what sort of name do I want to establish for myself within this field? But then this further got drilled down for me when I met and subsequently became very close to Judith Hill. And Judith Hill asks me this question and she was like, Michael, you know, what type of astrologer do you want to be? How do you want to show up within the world? And I think that that's a very important thing for us to answer because answering that question gives us all a clear sense of direction, but it also gives us a center of gravity. When you know who you want to become, it gives you a center of gravity that causes you to always feel a sense of stability within yourself. And also when you know who you want to become, it gives you a sense of direction about what are the things I have to do in order to get there. And so you begin to set clear goals for yourself. And setting clear goals also has to do with setting clear timelines. What type of astrologer do you want to be within the course of the next four months? What type of astrologer do you want to be within the course of the next eight months? What type of astrologer do you want to be at the end of a year? What type of astrology do you want to be at the end of two years? And which environment can I plug myself into that best facilitates these desires that I have? And can that environment, whether it's an environment that I hold on to and that I create myself through self-study, or whether that's an environment that I find myself going towards in terms of enrolling in a program, can that environment keep me to my deadline of becoming this particular type of astrologer within this time frame? Because if it can't, you need to find yourself in a new environment. The next thing is to aim to be a complete astrologer and complete is spelled C-O-M-P-L-E-A-T because I got that from William Lilly's autobiography in which he was speaking about a great astrologer at that time. And he said that this person was the most complete astrologer in the world. And I love that concept, that concept of being the most complete astrologer there can be. Within the West, we have this concept of astrological specialization which doesn't exist in the East. In Vedic astrology, the Vedic astrologer is 
a horary astrologer, a natal astrologer, a sinistry astrologer, an electional astrologer, a medical astrologer, a mundane astrologer, a fertility astrologer, a religious astrologer. All the types of astrologers are held within the context of that one astrologer in ways that would be baffling to the Western astrologer because the Western astrologer tends to want to be a specialist. And a lot of Western astrological programs that are currently available online today are programs that focus on turning people into astrological specialists. And I think we can learn far more from our Vedic counterparts about this point than we give them credit for. Because the Vedic astrologer is a complete astrologer. Why can't we be the same? Why do we have in the West the system of you go to this person for electional, you go to this person for horror, you go to this person for medical, you go to this person for this. No, one astrologer within the context of us practicing the astrology that we practice should be able to practice all things because our field isn't just natal astrology, our field is astrology. And so for me, within my personal practice, my daily dedication is to me being the most complete astrologer I can be, which includes the complete spectrum of all the branches of astrology, horary, electional, the subcategories of electional, subcategories of horary, natal astrology, the subcategories of natal astrology, natal, medical, sinistry, natal, electional, all of the things, predictive as well as mundane and all of the ways in which mundane astrology can be specifically applied to my practice because all of those things make us into complete astrologers. So my charge to everyone is don't just aim on being one type of astrologer, but take a note from our Vedic astrological counterparts and become complete within all the branches of astrology. Now that brings us to our next point of first things first, because I know that when I say that in the very Plutonian way that I say things, it's like, oh my God, you know, what do I do? Where do I start? And going back to Margaret C. Hone's quote in her book, The Textbook of Modern Astrology, it doesn't really matter which of several necessities is learned first. It doesn't really matter which of several necessities is learned first. And that is a really important point that it doesn't matter where you start. I'm currently teaching a Kabbalistic tarot course and students had questions and I started teaching the tarot from the perspective of the King of Wands. And the King of Wands conversation turned into a conversation about the Knight of Wands, which turned into a conversation about the Chariot card, which turned into a conversation about the Lovers, which turned into a conversation about the Strength card. And it just mushroomed from this initial starting point because it does not matter which of several necessities is learned first. And truthfully speaking, we can start anywhere within the context of learning the foundations of classical astrology. There are some years I teach FOCA, the foundations of classical astrology, and I start by teaching the aspects. There are some years when I start and I teach astronomy first. There are some years when I start and I teach the elements first. There are some years I start and I teach ancient philosophy first. But it does not matter which of several first things is learned first. And so, you have to become clear on what those first things are, but then organize your relationship to that information. So the next thing is a depth of beginning. This concept of a depth of beginning comes to us from the Sapi Yetzira, where it says that as God, as, as Elohe Elohim created the heavens and the earth, he created it with a depth of beginning and a depth of end, a depth of good and a depth of evil, a depth of height and a depth of low. And this, this concept that all of these depths were everlasting depths that had no end. And so astrologically speaking, we should start our practice with a depth of beginning, which means that we have to first identify what the foundations of our practice actually are. But we also have to broaden our understanding of what the foundations are so that our foundations becomes deeper than somebody else's advanced. And that, for me, is something that brings me a great amount of joy. The fact that within the basic astrology that I teach, I teach concepts that for other people are advanced astrological concepts. Within our basic astrology, every student learns 
concepts of antitia and contra antitia. Every student learned within their first four months of studying how to calculate the lot of fortune, the lot of spirit, how to memorize the antitia and contra antitia, how to find and identify eighth harmonic aspects of the semi-square and the sesqui quadrate, how to identify all levels of essential dignity and all levels of essential debility, all levels of accidental fortitude and accidental debility. It is a depth of beginning. Declination, what declination is and how to use it astrologically speaking. These things really excite me from an astrological perspective because I know that my depth of beginning is is higher and deeper than somebody else's advanced. And I think that when you set yourself up in that sort of way, where your depth of beginning is deeper than somebody else's foundations or deeper than someone else's fundamentals, then you truly set yourself up to be the shining star within whatever arena of astrological pursuit you desire to place yourself into. Practice concrete astrology. And we spoke about this earlier, about this concept of practicing concrete astrology with the perspective of knowing that if I can speak to the concrete realities within the life of a person, then I can find what has created the psychology of this person. Whereas oftentimes within psychological astrology, the approach is to speak about the psychology as if the psychology were the creator of itself. But in fact, all of us are the products of our environment and the way in which our environment impacts us directly. And the only way we can have an understanding of the environment in a way that is concrete and tangible and real is if we start from practicing concrete astrology first and then integrating the psychological themes within our practice so that even in that regard, we nullify this dichotomy between concrete astrology and psychological astrology and that thick barrier that has separated these two fields of astrology for so long becomes a pathway and becomes a highway from the concrete to the psychological. Mentorship. Find someone who knows more than you do and find someone who is an expert within the specific field of study that you yourself want to become expert in. And mentorship oftentimes occurs within a one-on-one -on -one capacity, but I'm also not averse to mentorship within a group setting. And I think that it takes a lot of skill to provide mentorship within a group setting. And it's also more stressful as a teacher to provide mentorship to a group of students as opposed to one student at a time. And it's something that I strive to create at Oraculos, this sense of group mentorship where everyone is heard and everyone's listened to. And I know something about everyone and I know how every student within every course that I teach practices. I know how every student within every astrology course I teach practices because that is my responsibility as being someone who's bringing in a new generation of astrologers into the world. I need to know something about every student who comes to my hands. So I can't have a classroom with 400 students, which is at the moment a habit within astrology to have a classroom with 400 students, 200 students, 100 students. I can't have a classroom with 100 students because I can't know 100 students as clearly as I can know 30 students. And so mentorship and being in a space that allows you to be seen and being in a space that allows you to be heard as well is also an important part of our astrological experience. Another thing is that there has to be a line of communication between the person who is teaching and the people who are being taught. I heard recently about a, a scenario where students within a particular school don't have access to speaking to the teacher. Who runs that school? And that for me is absurd beyond measure because that then becomes a violating of astrology because we end up using astrology to make ourselves rich, but we're not using astrology to actually enrich the lives of others. How is it possible to teach astrology to people and them not being able to speak to you? This is not the way. And that is not how any traditional school of hand-to-hand -hand mentorship has ever been done or has ever been passed. No matter how many students are present, those students have a direct line of communication to you, even if the answer that you're going to give them is figure it out yourself. 
at least those students have the ability to come to you and bring you their questions for you to reflect it back to them and say, wow, you know, that's a really educated question that you're asking. And within the context of the question that you just asked, I know that you can also figure it out yourself. Even if that's gonna be your response to them, a student should have the ability to speak to their mentor because astrology is a handcrafted field. We handcraft the next generation of astrologers. We don't automatically certify them because they were one within a classroom of 400 people and they just so happened to finish the semester. We should be handcrafting the artisans of astrology for the future. Next thing is continuing education. My guru, BKS Iyengar, said that a good book is better than a bad teacher. And I believe that a good mentor is better than a stack of bad books, or it's even better than a stack of good books, but a mentor should also be able to point you in the direction of books that can transform your practice. Even if they say, hey, this entire book is great, but this one paragraph within this book, this is golden. And if you read this one paragraph and memorize this one paragraph, that will completely transform your entire astrological life. Within our Practice of Concrete Astrology Level 1 course that we teach at Arachilos, uh, there's a book that we read from Astrologia Gallica by Jean-Baptiste Mohan. And in, in section two of that book, Moran starts with a statement in the first paragraph where he says, determination by location is immediate. And every student in PCA1 at Oraculos has to memorize that statement. Determination by location is immediate. Determination by location is immediate. Because in PCA1, which is level two of the astrology that we teach at Oraculos, that is the most important thing you will learn in that entire semester. Determination by location is immediate. Now, I'm sure most people hearing that right now, like WTF, what, the, what does that mean? Determination by location is immediate. But the point is that the underlying education that has gone on within that astrologer and myself is such that hearing those words becomes an act of sacred prayer because it hits you someplace differently when you hear determination by location is immediate because it makes the entire gamut of astrology and every field of astrology we practice make more sense. Determination by location is immediate. And if you want to know what that means, then join PCA1 to find out for yourself. But a good mentor should be able to point you in the direction of good books. And those good books should be tailored specifically to the sort of astrologer you want to become, which takes us back to the first point we made. Now, if the books that you're purchasing, you're just insatiably purchasing books on Amazon, stop step away from your Amazon Prime account and stop buying things. Because how many of us constantly buy astrology books and fill our houses from the ceiling to the floor with those books and never read them? That happens continuously within astrology. And as much as I'm sure the authors of those books are grateful, that's also not the way for us to consolidate information within ourselves. So just stop and give yourself the ability to curate a library, even if that means emailing your favorite astrologer and saying, hey, what are the top three books you think I should read right now? And you get your list of books, knowing that some books require a mentor to guide you through them. Reading Bonatti on Basic Astrology, books one through three, which Dr. Benjamin Dykes has translated and put into three books. Reading that book is one of the most confusing things if you don't have a greater philosophical context about where Bonatti was coming from and some of the philosophical streams that feed into his understanding of the world. And so it does require a psychopomp and a guide and the person to stand in the role of Mercury to guide you through some of the nuances of that language so that you can understand where Bonatti is coming from. So yes, Get a good book list from a good teacher, but also know that some books require a good teacher to help you to navigate them or someone who spent years of their own lives pouring over those books so that they could help you to get there in a quicker, more efficient way. The next thing, after you have 
your clear goals and your clear sense of direction and you put your first things first, you have your mentor and you have your books, you have to practice. You have to actually practice astrology, which is why at Oraculos, we have the foundations of classical astrology. And then from there, you have the practice of concrete astrology one through three. And then you have the advanced practice of concrete astrology one through four. There are, are these practices and this practical approach to astrology that we all have to participate in because the practice of concrete astrology and the practice of astrology in general is what allows us to be great astrologers. One of my mentors uh, in Cape Cod actually said to me once that, and you know, I'm 50-50 I'm on this statement, but he said to me once that the great astrologers are in the people who are coming out with the books once a year, once a season, constantly writing the books and coming out with books because a great astrologer is in the field practicing astrology. And if any of you are in the field practicing astrology every single day, you know for a fact that all of the hours of the day are consumed with the astrology that you're practicing and you don't actually have the time to invest in sitting down and reading or writing. And writing becomes another task within itself that you have to become very disciplined about. I'm sure I saw Terry put in the chat box below that Terry is a doctor of oriental medicine. If you are in the field practicing your oriental medicine every day, I'm sure it becomes very difficult to actually sit down and write about oriental medicine because the practice of whatever we're doing should become all-consuming. It should drown us. It should completely envelop us from all sides so that we become a living embodiment of that practice. And you cannot grow fluency and you cannot grow speed and you cannot grow a sense of internal greatness within what you're doing unless you're practicing and you're in the trenches practicing every single day the astrology that you love. Which doesn't always have to look like client practice. It could look like reading a chart every day just for the purpose of reading a chart. But ultimately, our astrology should matriculate into client practice because hearing the stories of people's lives in tandem to the readings that we give them make us better astrologers. Next point is to practice prediction. Astrology is predictive. When you look at a baby's chart and say, which... Those of you who know me know that I am no fond person of looking at baby's charts. Do not bring the chart of your newborn baby to me. I will not read it. But when we look at the baby's chart and we say, this child is going to be a business executive, or this child is going to be warm and loving, or this child is going to be very good at mathematics, that is prediction. When we look at the chart of a client who's booked a reading with us a week in advance, and we look at that chart a week earlier, we say very specific things about the chart that we're looking at. Even if the specific things that we're saying are psychological things, this person is a kind and a loving person, but oftentimes because of their lack of boundaries, has the tendency to let people walk over them. And because of that, this person has chosen to not really express their kind, loving nature within the world. And they choose to be a hermit because they know that when they open up, people can take advantage of them. You know, that, that storyline can go on and on. But when we say that, and when we find ourselves writing paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs about a person's lived experience who we haven't even met yet, we are practicing prediction. So this, this, this modern concept that astrology is somehow not predictive is malarkey, because every aspect of our astrology is predictive. Therefore, we shouldn't run from practicing the actual section of astrology that we specifically call predictive astrology. Because if we look back even as far in the, in the Tetra Biblos of Claudius Ptolemy, his entire beginning of the book has to do with the astrologer using astrology for the act of prognostication. And prognostication is foretelling the future. So we should not run from that. And while that sets us up to be in a more riskier position because telling the future is a black hole, white endeavor. You either get it right or you get it wrong. Lean into that. 
lean into that discomfort that you have around predictive astrology and allow yourself to grow as a result of leaning into that. Because when you lean into that discomfort, you would be that much further than the person who chooses to view that as a barricade and get stuck there. Now, the next thing that which goes to what we spoke about earlier, Lindsay, is to develop systematic intelligence, which simply means pick a system and follow through. Pick a system that makes sense for you and follow through with that system so that as you're following through, you find yourself growing upon the bones of your astrological ancestors. And that's what we should be doing. We should be growing on the bones of the astrologers who have gone before so that our bones as well can be a stable foundation for the astrologers who will come after us. And if our own bones aren't strong because they haven't been fortified by the past, then those bones that we grow within ourselves will be of no value to the next generation of astrologers in the future. So find the system, grow within that system, and allow yourself to spread your wings completely within the boundaries of that system, because a system doesn't necessarily serve as a point of restriction on restricting your greater spiritual process, but a system gives you a safe framework within which to expand fully and endlessly your internal spiritual and intuitive self. People think that the intuition precedes the system, but the system actually serves as a framework within which your intuition can grow. Find the system and plug yourself into a system. And the last thing on our list is to live a life of service. Live a life of dedication. Within this three-pronged uh, Kriya Yoga approach that has tapas, which means hard, arduous practice, though the burning heat that we take to our practice every single day, and then spadhyaya, our self-study, our dedication to studying. The last piece is Ishvara Pranidhana. And Ishvara within the yogic philosophy is representing the Godhead or the deity or the numinous. And Pranidhana means a dedication or living a life of dedication. So Ishvara Pranidhana translates as dedication to God or a dedication to the numinous or a dedication to the divine. And if you are dedicating yourself to something greater than yourself, then you realize that the fruits of the greatness that you're establishing within yourself, they're not even yours to, to, to eat. They're not even yours to consume. And you realize that you have no other choice but to be an extraordinary astrologer or to be an excellent astrologer or to be a great astrologer because at that point you aren't just being great as a massaging of your own personal ego but you're being great because you cannot be anything less than great because the astrology that you're building within yourself is the temple of the eternal the knowledge that you're building within yourself is the temple of the divine and if you choose to build the, the temple of astrology within yourself for the divine to come and dwell within that temple, then the greater understanding has to be that you, astrologer, are a caretaker and a custodian of that temple. And in the same way as we would not allow a temple that we build to a god to run into ruins, but we maintain that every day. We bring fresh flowers every day. We sweep the floor every day. We dust the altar every day. You are meant to have that same spirit of excellence in terms of the erection of the temple of astrology. This temple of stellar influence within yourself should be just as well tended to as any physical temple that you might dedicate to any deity within the world. And when we dedicate our practice to that which is beyond ourselves, and when we can identify that which is beyond ourselves within every client who we meet, then we realize that our astrology is meant to spread this internal understanding of divine living with everyone. And so we are demanded to live a life of service. We are demanded to cultivate an excellent astrology so that we can share that excellent astrology with others. But a deeper part of this that I think is also part of the practice of astrology being a received tradition is that at some level, we should all consider one day stepping into a role of teaching others and stepping into a role of mentoring others as well. 
One of the greatest misfortunes that I found within astrology today is that there are people who are world famous for having written astrology books or people who are world famous for some other contribution to astrology, but they cannot bring themselves around to handcrafting a next generation of astrologers. And they also can bring themselves around to the concept of mentoring an astrologer one-on-one. -on -one. And while different strokes work for different folks, I think that when you enter a field like astrology and you realize the greater mystical tradition that it relies on, you also have to realize that it is the, the duty of every adept and it is the duty of every master to have an acolyte, to have a protege, to have a mentee, to have an apprentice. And that doesn't mean that you open up a school. That doesn't mean that you have a full romping curriculum that you offer, but it means that you avail yourself as a part of you giving back to astrology something or someone of greatness you avail yourself to the process of teaching the next generation. And that might be just one person. Because all of us, we take from astrology. Astrology is our mother, and we've all made a living from astrology. We've all made our fame and fortune from astrology. We've all built our tiny empires on astrology. Why can we not give back to astrology something of our own selfless service? And that is where the role of mentorship comes from. So if you have been mentored, if you have been trained, if you have been guided in a way that allows you to have become an excellent astrologer, when someone comes knocking at your door, if someone comes knocking at your door, remember this conversation and allow yourself to step forward into someone's life so that you can spread this light of astrology with others so that the beauty and the perfection and the excellence of our astrology doesn't die within our generation. So that is my list of things, of all of the things that an astrologer aiming to excellence and aiming towards greatness should know. And at the end of the day, the, 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 the battle cry within this is that if you want to be extraordinary, align yourself with spaces that give you a touchstone of the extraordinary in a practical and a real way. And that could be through self-study, that could be through studying with me, that could be through studying with someone who has proven themselves to be extraordinary, not just at their ability to speak astrology, because that's another thing that we find in the 21st century. There, everyone has a YouTube channel, everyone speaks astrology, everyone knows how to talk astrology, and everyone is an astrological philosopher. But the people who can prove their practice of astrology are the people who you need to study with. The people who can prove their ability and their facility with reading a chart, because fundamentally that's what our astrology boils down to. Can you read a chart and can you read a chart exquisitely and gracefully well in a way that allows me to know that there is some magic left in the world? And if a person can prove that to you, and if a person has demonstrated their prowess and their skill at being extraordinary at reading a chart blind on the spot without any background information at all that person is a person who for me is someone who you should study with and any astrologer who i've ever studied with consistently has been an astrologer who's been able to demonstrate that skill Mentorship is expensive, and I've paid a lot of money for it. I paid a small fortune on mentorship in my life. But the people, the only people who I've stuck with have been people who've been able to demonstrate the skill of astrology in action for me. And I've also had a one session here or two sessions here with people who talk astrology or who can write a good astrology report. But the written report astrologer is not someone I'm impressed with. The philosophical astrologer is not someone I'm impressed with. The person who can talk about technique but has no demonstrable ability to demonstrate technique is not someone I'm impressed with. And I think that today, the astrologer coming into practice astrology, the new students coming into practice astrology should come in with greater discrimination and should come in looking for that as a hallmark of greatness within the astrologers who they study with. 
why invest a small fortune in studying with someone if they haven't yet demonstrated their ability to practice? A person's following isn't a demonstration of that ability. A person's spoken word isn't a demonstration of that ability. The only demonstration of that ability is through the cold and hard act of putting a chart before someone and allowing that person to read. And if a person can prove that skill to you, that is a person to study with. That is a person to hitch your wagon onto. As Catherine Yeager McQuaid, one of our students says, that is a person to ally yourself with. And if a person cannot prove that to you, or if a person is too busy within their practice to prove that to you, or too busy within their practice to give you a reading, or too busy within their practice to read for anyone at all, and you can't, you can't book them at all, and they're all booked out for the next 10 years, that should be a red flag. If a person can only give you a written report, a, a recording of them giving you a reading, but they can't actually sit within the presence of you and read your chart, that should be a red flag. So students of astrology entering this field come with more discrimination, come with more demand, and expect more from the people who you are investing in. Because those are the people who you will be hitching your wagon to. So that is the end of my tiny spiel. Lindsay, thank you for facilitating that. And, and thanks to everyone for being here. And I'm going to shut up now, Lindsay. <laughs> Well, I don't have any more questions. And that is, and we are actually at time. So everyone, I just want to thank you all for being here. You have been more than gracious with your time and you've been more than gracious with sitting here and coming to this conversation. I didn't actually think that anyone would show up for this, but I'm, I'm super happy that you all uh, showed up. And, and showing up is a big part of it as well. Showing up and being present and doing the work. So thank you all for being here. And uh, does anyone, do, do any of you have any questions at this moment? So the next thing that we have coming up at Oraculos in terms of events is we have our open house, which is going to be on August the 28th. That is a free open house. It's Saturday, August the 28th at 11 a.m. So if you can make it for that, please do make it because it would be lovely to have you all there. And it would be lovely to speak to you more about some of the programs and offerings that we have at Oraculos. And then the next real event that we have, which is going to be a workshop, is how to use consultation charts in astrology. And the consultation chart, if you don't know, is the chart that you cast at the beginning of an actual reading. And, you know, I have a very specific way of using consultation charts. So if you don't use them, then please do sign up for our using consultation charts in astrology uh, program that we have coming up on Saturday, September 25th. And the last thing I'm going to mention here, because you can look up everything else on the website, is we have at the end of October, a celebration of magic event. And in that we will be having three masterclasses two of them by me, one on horary astrology, the other on Kabbalistic tarot, and the last one on astrological hand analysis by master hand analyst Dylan Warren Davis. Dylan has chosen to become a member of our faculty at the Oracular School of Astrology, and next year he will be running his master's program, which will be a complete certification and diploma program in astrological hand analysis. It is an amazing program and astrological hand analysis is an amazing part of the Western esoteric tradition. So in the Western esoteric tradition, we have astrology, we have tarot, we have hand analysis, we have geomancy, and Dylan Warren Davis, master hand analyst and master herbalist, is going to be coming to Oraculos to run his diploma program in chiromancy, which is the traditional title for hand analysis. So please do check out our Celebration of Magic program at the end of October, and I look forward to seeing you all there, and you can find out more information on our events page and I look forward to having all of you in class with us. It looks like we have one question from Matt. Okay, awesome. Matt, please, uh, what's your question? Sure, yeah, it was um, in reference to the first point that you brought up about setting goals. Um, you said that Judith Hill asked you what kind of astrologer uh, you wanted to be and I was kind of wondering uh, what was the answer that you came up with? 
Thank you, Matt. Thank you, thank you very much, Matt. Matt, what you have to know, and even though I don't give my chart out in general ever, I, I do let people know that I'm a very Plutonian person. <laughs> so in my very stereotypical Plutonian way, I said to Judith, I want to be extraordinary. I want to be extraordinary. I want to be excellent within this field of astrology. And, and for me, I know that when I say that word without context, it's a stressful word to hear. But what for me an extraordinary astrologer looks like is someone who is helpful and someone who has all of the tools necessary in order to help their students in an even deeper way or in order to help their clients in an even deeper way. So that for me is really the hallmark of a great astrologer. It's not all the things you know or all of the flashing signs you have or the amount of followers you have. What for me looks like being an extraordinary astrologer is who is most helpful and who can render the most help to the people who come to them seeking that help. So that too is a part of my larger religious disposition in life that I live with this deep religiosity that I want to be extraordinarily helpful to people and I want to know as much as I need to know in order for me to be helpful and when you set that as a goal there are some things that you need to know that are helpful and there are some things that aren't helpful and it's important to be able to identify the difference between that and having a mentor helps us to cut through some of the mishugana and having a mentor allows us to cut through some of the, 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 the chaff or chafe or however you call that so that you can really find what is the kernel that you need to be holding on to within the various things that you're learning. So extraordinarily helpful is the response to that question. I want to be an extraordinarily helpful astrologer and I want to be excellent at being of service. Yeah, that's awesome. That um, uh, makes sense with uh, some of your uh, points about what makes an excellent astrologer with like being complete and um, having like those deep foundations. So yeah, that makes sense. I also had uh, quick questions about FOCA um, mm -hmm. and the programs that you have um, and kind of maybe like the order that the programs go in. Um, do you have to start with FOCA before you just take concrete? Okay. Um, and then with FOCA, do you guys use modern planets and the aspects beyond Ptolemy? Is that something that... In FOCA, we lay a rigorous traditional foundation for the first two months, and then we integrate Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto with a very specific conversation around how we use them. And then we also integrate the octile aspects, which would be the semi-square and the sesquiquadrate, quadrate as being a larger part of the hard aspect family, but that's all. So we don't use quintiles, biquintiles, we're not using septiles, we're not using any deciles or noviles or non-iles or anything, but we use the hard aspects uh, and that entire hard aspect family of the semi-square and the sesquic quadrate as well because of the ways in which they oftentimes show up in a concrete way within the lives of people. So that's what we do. And the reason why we started FOCA isn't because I believe that everyone coming to Oraculos is going to be a raw beginner having never learned any astrology, but it's because of the background that we establish. And that background that we establish in the monad, the duad, the triad, the tetrad, the pentad, Pythagoras, the, mon the, the background that we establish in pre-Socratic philosophy, the background that we establish in Guido Bonatti and Abraham Ibn Ezra, the background that we establish in how to view astrology from this wider philosophical perspective is something that serves as the undercurrent of every other thing that we do at Oraculos. And devoid of that background, it's impossible for me to teach someone astrology. And a lot of people sign up in the summer when I have um, horror intensives or natal chart reading intensives. They sign up in the summer because they're like, ah, oh, I only want to learn this thing. But what ends up happening in a lot of those summer intensives is I have to pick information from FOCA in order to teach in the intensive. 
Because in a Hori intensive, if I'm using the declination table, but the student has no understanding between in the ecliptic and the celestial equator and how you measure degrees north and south of the celestial equator and how that gives us declination, then that student coming into my Hori intensive in the summer will be completely lost and confused because their understanding of what their foundational training is, is very different from the understanding of foundational training that I offer my students. And I need to know that in any intensive I offer, in any course I offer, the students all have the same even footing, even if that means me starting from the beginning. Okay, great. And uh, you said FOCA starts, is that like, is it, is it a month or? <laughs> FOCA starts in September. FOCA is an entire 16-week program that starts this coming September. September 8th is the orientation for FOCA, and then FOCA actually begins on September 11th, and we meet on weekends. And I'll send you all the information, Matt, so that you can look into that. But FOCA is really the most important thing I teach at Oraculos, and you can take FOCA and take nothing else at Oraculos except for FOCA because FOCA is everything I know and every way I would like to teach a new astrologer versus a, a Kabbalistic tarot reader versus someone who's going to study astrological hand analysis or someone who's going to study hermetic alchemy. All of that is encapsulated within FOCA because FOCA is that sweeping. So if I were to die tomorrow and there was only one thing I could have given the world, FOCA would have been that single kernel of truth that I would love to impart to people. So I'll send you more information about it, Matt, so that you could you could uh, have everything you need to make a decision about it. I hope you join us. Great. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for being here. You've all been wonderful. And have a wonderful, beautiful day.